the the main rest of what we're going to talk about are non-point sources, which just to make sure everybody knows what one is, it's not a point source. Um, and uh, a point source is uh, essentially something you can think about as as a form of pollution entering a water body through a discrete conveyance, which could be a pipe or a ditch or what have you. There is another category which is not point sources, <laughs> which are those point sources that um, Congress, for example, has exempted from the Clean Water Act. But normally point sources have permits and non-point sources um, don't. And um, non-point sources are a huge problem for this country and Congress essentially said when, passed, when it passed the Clean Water Act is let's let the states figure out what to do about non-point sources and that really has not worked out very well, like not at all. Um, and we think things are bad here, things are you know, a lot worse in some other states where they don't have a thing like the Oregon Forest Practices Act, which Mary will talk about. In any case, in 1990, Congress passed the Coastal Zone Act Reauthorization Amendments, otherwise known as CESARA, a little known law that was intended to focus attention on coastal non-point source pollution um, because the coasts attract a lot of, um, of population increases and they're particularly sensitive and the problems were starting to build up and, and could not be denied. Um, so Cesara is, is co-administered by EPA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the NOAA. So um, when I talk about federal agencies, if I do, it would be EPA and NOAA all together. Um, and and Cesara is kind of a carrot and stick operation um, that is intended to uh, encourage states to adopt programs to control coastal or to control non-point source pollution in coastal watersheds, which in Oregon includes the entirety of the road and the Umpqua, um, and to penalize them if they don't, uh, because it basically acts as a gate to the federal funds, federal grant funds that come from the federal government to states through two other statutes, the Clean Water Act and um, the CZMA. And the statute basically has uh, dates in it and percentage cuts that say if you are not, um, if you're not fully approved, your state program is not fully approved, then you're going to get a funding cut and it's supposed to be more or less automatic. However, because states didn't get their act together, um, I guess they never did have it together, and they still don't. Um, the uh, EPA NOAA came up with this idea of conditional approval, um, which is not in the statute. And uh, the notion was that um, that a state could basically make a set of promises, in three years we'll have this in place, in two years we'll have that in place. And on that basis, uh, the state's program would be, quote, conditionally approved. Um, and more, most importantly, from the state's perspective, the funding would continue to flow. Um, so we'll get back to that in a second, but um, base, the basic thrust of Cesara is, it will sound familiar to those of you who know the basic thrust of the Clean Water Act, which is it's two-pronged. It calls for a technology-based approach called, and the lingo is different, it's called management measures or best management practices, but they're called management measures under Cesara. And then if the technology-based approach isn't adequate to meet water quality standards and protect designated uses, which is from fishing, swimming, drinking water, those kinds of things, then states need to have what are called additional management measures in place. So um, it's sufficient to meet water quality standards. The management measures are put out in a big guidance book, um, which is the management measures are actually quite slim and not very informative and certainly not very prescriptive. There's a lot of text that goes with them that supposedly describes you know, what the goals were. And they're in six areas, forestry, agriculture, urban, marinas, hydro modification, which is like shoreline and channel changes, um, and then loss of wetlands and riparian areas. This um, project of the state of Oregon and other states trying to get um, full approval of their programs has been going on for a very long time with sort of deliveries of documents and then um, EPA and NOAA saying, yeah, yeah we, think you, we think you did that one okay, but you're not doing this one okay and that not okay consistently has been forest practices. 
the one and only time before now that um, EPA and NOAA made a public declaration of what the status of what the Oregon's program was, was in 1998. And their findings then were that for forestry, um, the state needed to adopt additional management measures such that they would be sufficient to meet water quality standards for um, areas of small and medium-sized stream protection, um, pesticides, logging, certain kinds of high-risk logging roads, and areas of logging where there's a risk of landslide. Um, and uh, they never asked that question, are, the, are these generic management measures in this book adequate to protect water quality from other non-point source activities such as agriculture? I, we have boxes and boxes of, of materials through, that we obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, and they're simply, the question was never asked, or at least I haven't found it. Um, so in 2009, uh, North Coast Environmental Advocates sued the federal agencies, challenging their conditional approval, and we settled our case on basically sort of two, two main thrusts. One was that Oregon DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, which regulates or doesn't regulate um, water pollution, <coughs> a little ahead of myself there, um, uh, established that they had, through the Attorney General's office, established that they had the authority essentially to work around Oregon's Forest Practices Act and to work around the Board of Forestry if they did not create adequate forest practices, which they haven't. Um, and having established that they had that authority, Oregon DEQ then committed to doing um, a, a pilot project called the Total Maximum Daily Load in Mid Coast Basin. And this pilot project would not be the TMDL as it's normally <coughs> done under the Clean Water Act, but it would be souped up and it would, uh, it would basically have two um, thrusts. One was that it would be clear about what were the practices needed um, on the land to control non-point sources sufficiently to meet water quality standards. And then the second thrust um, was that, that it would be enforceable. Um, and uh, Oregon DEQ actually agreed to issue enforceable orders to significant non-point sources. Um, so that was the Oregon State package, was commitments made by, by the Oregon DEQ. Um, and then the other part of the settlement was that the federal agency agreed to make a proposed approval or disapproval finding by late last year. They changed the date by themselves, but anyway, that was a little weird. Um, put it out for public comment, which is where we are right now, and make a final decision approving or disapproving Oregon's program by May 15th of this year, and that if they disapprove, to immediately be uh, cutting off Oregon's funding pursuant to the way the statute um, discusses it. So to make a long story short, uh, after some people in this room participated in a lot of meetings, um, Oregon DEQ it continues to work on this TMDL in the Mid-Coast Basin, but it's no longer a pilot project for anything. It's uh, DEQ has walked away from its commitments that were the basis of the settlement. Um, and then uh, late last year, middle of last year, DEQ um, made a sort of last plea to the federal agencies, truly believing, it turns out, that they could convince these federal agencies, EPA and NOAA, and then NIPS is part of NOAA, so um, they've been involved. But um, that despite the fact that the federal agencies have been complaining about Oregon's forest practices repeatedly, year after year, very, very clearly, no uncertain terms, they apparently thought they could convince the federal agencies to issue a proposed approval. And I thought that was sort of a joke, but I've subsequently discovered that they apparently really believed that. And um, their, last, uh, their last argument was that essentially Oregon's land use laws were so great that Oregon should be relieved of needing to meet water quality standards from logging. Um, well, that didn't work, and so um, we are now in a uh, two-thirds or so of the way through a 90-day public comment period um, on, on the proposed disapproval. And the, the proposal uh, proposes to disapprove only on the basis of forestry issues. They added, they had taken pesticides out, and then they put pesticides back in, um, and but they've only put them in with regard to um, non-fish-bearing streams. 
Um, and apparently EPA and NOAA think that the fish bearing streams are being fully protected by Urban's program. Um, yeah, here's some snake rain, I'm not surprised. Um, do they have any data to support that? <laughs> no, I don't think they do. Um, and then, in fact, they don't really discuss it. There's a lot of this proposed action that they don't discuss. They don't, in fact, discuss anything that they have informally told Oregon that they've approved. So they've only I've really asked for public comment on the things that they're proposing to disapprove, which I find odd because it would seem to set them up for not being able to do a final approval, which is what I'd like to see, but in any case. Um, and then they put on the table um, agriculture, and they didn't say we're proposing to disapprove on the basis of agriculture, but they did say we are expressing concern um, in part because these low gradient waters where agriculture runoff affects um, are waters that are very important to the Oregon Coast coho threat species. Um, and they then mention a few things. They say they're concerned there's not much enforcement, there are no specific riparian buffers for ag, um, that the state is just focused on impairment, not protection, um, and that there's no tracking, and that the Oregon Department of Agriculture really doesn't do anything regulatorily um, or much of anything else on what are called legacy issues. Legacy is anything that's happened in the past. And my experience with ODA is that the past is sort of like five days ago. Um, so that, that's based on what people have explained to me about how they do enforcement. Um, and I, I, I wrote down here, <laughs> that the proposed disapproval has lit a fire under the governor's office. Um, uh, but to be honest with you, um, like, uh, like one of those little toggle switches, I don't know, sort of, I, you know, my sense of whether the governor's office is serious, taking this seriously or not, sort of goes back and forth on any given day. There's a little bit of information. And Mary sent me something yesterday that made the information seem le I'm less likely that um, I would say the state is, even though it's not that many millions of dollars, that they are concerned about the money. They're concerned about how it affects the specific agencies, which is Oregon DEQ and PLCD um, that get the money from the federal uh, government. And, and they're concerned, I think, about perception. Um, maybe that's because the governor is running for re-election. Um, I, 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 you know, it's far be it for me to understand sort of what motivates a state um, to, to do something. But if the state does get disapproved, it will be the first state in the union to be disapproved for failing to have an approvable uh, program to control non-point sources. Um, so I'm gonna take one or two minutes and try and just briefly touch on the pesticide issue. Um, the, the federal, uh, this, is, this is obtained through looking at these emails from the federal agencies. Um, the federal agencies were very frustrated that Oregon was not doing anything about pesticides. But no, as pesticides on logging lands, they weren't concerned about pesticides from agriculture, roads, or anything else. Um, and at some point, despite the fact that the federal government had been fighting a series of lawsuits brought by Washington Toxics Coalition, NCAP, um, they that had resulted in an injunction issued by a federal court that created buffers around streams and when, where pesticides can be sprayed. Despite the fact that the federal government had been fighting that tooth and nail, the federal agency staff in, that looking at the Cesar issue said, oh look at that, there's a court injunction. And even though Oregon hasn't done squat to control pesticides on logging lands, we can claim credit for that injunction and we can say that Oregon has now solved its pesticide on logging lands problem. Um, which was bizarre, uh, but I guess you could say, okay, fine, except for the injunction wasn't permanent. And the injunction began to uh, fade away, <coughs> pesticide by pesticide, at, at, as pursuant to a settlement in a, yet another lawsuit, the National Marine Fisheries Service began issuing biological opinions that are basically the consultation process called for by the Endangered Species Act. So every time NIMS would create a biological opinion, the, the injunction would cease to exist, which is all fine and well if you think that that biological opinion means anything. Well, what happened is the biological opinions found that, there, uh, that some of these pesticides were posing jeopardy and adverse modification of habitat, 
to certain threatened and endangered salmon around, around the region. Um, so you, now you know that they pose a danger because NIMS said so, right? Um, but the problem is that NIMS can only provide that information back to EPA, and it's EPA that writes the labels, and the labels that supposedly control how people spray the pesticides or use them in other ways. So EPA didn't buy the NIMS version of, of why the pesticides were dangerous, and EPA has not changed the labels, and that's a whole other set of litigation. Um, but the point being that the injunction has fallen away piece by piece. Nothing has been put in to protect uh, threatened and endangered salmon or other species um, from the use of these pesticides, and yet EPA and NOAA in the Cesara context had already given an informal approval to Oregon's program as being adequate. Um, and uh, having pointed that out to them over a period of time, I think they began to realize they had a bit of a problem. So when they went to this proposed disapproval, for whatever set of reasons, they decided that the controls on pesticides for fish-bearing streams are adequate, but they're uh, in, in doubt for non-fish-bearing streams. So there you have it. Um, and um, one of the only thing that we can point to that, in terms of the governor's office um, being responsive to this proposed disapproval, is that um, the governor's office staff did go to the Board of Forestry late last year and encourage a speedy resolution to a rulemaking that now Mary is going to talk about. I might talk about it, but I think we're going to make it in work. Go down to the PowerPoint for your next slide. Where? Oh, no more. My screen. Do you know how to why my screen went off? Like here? Yeah, you need to go to the displays and preferences. And right now, that's your primary display. Okay. So if you go to the Apple menu. Sorry, guys. <laughs> preferences and preferences. Yeah. Okay. Uh, go to displays. <laughs> yeah, I can just bring it. Interesting. And when you so, as Nina mentioned, my name is Mary Skurlock. I, for about 20 years, worked for Pacific Rivers Council. <coughs> Before that, I was, for several years, a land use attorney in Eugene. Um, and now I am sort of a rogue consultant uh, working for a couple of coalitions of environmental groups. And my primary uh, issue right now is working on Oregon forest practices. And before I start, I want to say that I first came to this conference 25 years ago this year. And this conference was the reason that I ended up moving to Eugene and, um, and to Oregon. And so it's pretty great uh, to be here. I come back at least every couple of years. Um, this issue of Oregon forest practices adequacy for uh, aquatic ecosystems um, in its broadest sense, uh, water quality species, has been in play in Oregon for a long time. Um, and basically, I'm going to talk about four things. One is the importance of the non-federal forest lands uh, to uh, water quality and, and streams in Oregon, the basic deficiencies in the Oregon Forest Practices rules, um, the fact that these rules are significantly weaker than the ones in our neighboring states, and um, the limited but important rule revision that Nina mentioned, um, and that the outcome of that is not assured. Can I ask you to like sure. make that go so I can stand up? Um, okay, go. Um, the distribution of non-federal timber lands in the state of Oregon is uh, primarily on the coast. We do have some significant non-federal forest lands in uh, on the east side, um, uh, but this uh, sort of green, light green and dark green is uh, the non-federal timberlands. There are a lot of them. That's the point of that slide. <coughs> Most of the logging comes from the non-federal timberlands. Uh, sometimes as much as 80% of the logging in Oregon comes from them. So they are bearing a heavy load. Um, unfortunately, uh, coho are highly reliant on uh, non-federal timberlands um, uh, for their habitat. They just nat they naturally occur uh, on a lot of these lands and relative to some of the ag lands, which were previously some of the highly productive habitat for coho, um, they're actually uh, sometimes in better shape. So in Oregon Coastal Coho ESU, um, which is uh, uh, 
most of the, of the coho habitat in Oregon um, is 31 percent. Um, let me go to the next one. We also have the southern Oregon coastal coho. Uh, in uh, southern Oregon, there's a significant chunk of that that's also private industrial timberland. Um, the North Coast is probably the most reliant on non-federal uh, timberland. Um, you have a, all this red is private industrial that's managed under the Oregon Forest Practices Act. The yellow is the non-industrial smaller lands. And then the state lands are managed to a standard that are somewhat higher than the uh, private lands, um, but uh, still have some issues uh, there with their adequacy for um, protecting endangered species. So go on. Ooh, I didn't know it did that. But keep going. Okay. Um, so the conditions on private lands are that we have a lot of really young timber, uh, like really young, like sometimes it's not growing yet. Um, and it's basically uh, more than half of it's been logged since the early 70s, so that's a lot of activity. And this is sort of your standard 120 acre clear cut, um, which you generally have, most of the applications come in about 119 point something acres, which is the, the limit. So that's interesting, they found 120 acres in the coast range that didn't have a stream on it. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that. <laughs> Oh, going down there. That's your non-fish bearing stream. Right. So, um, okay, but, uh, yeah, so here you have your, your, your fish bearing stream buffer, that's sort of your, your 20 foot uh, buffer there is pretty standard. Um, the summary here is that a lot of our impaired streams are on uh, in industrial forest lands. Impaired meaning under Section 303D of the Clean Water Act, if you do not meet the water quality standards, you get listed. Um, we haven't really uh, tested or monitored all of these streams, so it's a subset of the streams, but we know that, for example, in the mid-coast, which is what uh, Nina was talking about as being the sort of pilot for um, uh, implementing the new way of implementing non-point source controls in the coast, um, uh, some this is older data, but they have never broken it out like this uh, since, so I keep using it. Something like 62% of the streams listed for temperature on private forests, uh, 50 in the Siletz, Yakina, in the... Um, they all see it's about 50 in the Sayus Law at 65. Um, and uh, for sediment, it's even higher. Um, so a lot of impaired streams on private forest land. Um, <coughs> temperature sediment, habitat modification, they used to get listed for that. They no longer do that. It's not considered a water quality standard. Um, but basically, 25% overall for those parameters are on private forest land. Um, nonetheless, the sort of ironic thing is there are some, there's really important habitat that occurs on these lands. Um, uh, uh, it's 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 critical stuff, and we need to, to sort of um, to protect what there is, or to, to keep to uh, uh, ensure that those systems can keep creating this kind of habitat. Um, I got to see this when we were um, under subpoena on uh, some private timberlands in the Oregon coast. Uh, just below this, there was a landslide, which we believe had to do with the management that had basically buried a big beaver pond. But this is the kind of low gradient habitat on the coast that is really important for coho salmon. Um, and you know, beaver ponds like this are not as common as they once were. So this is the kind of thing we really do want to see more of. Um, the basically three things that I'm going to talk about um, and that are the main problems that NOAA and EPA have identified uh, that Nina mentioned were the riparian areas, basically logging too close to the streams, removing shade, sources of large wood for habitat creation, and um, mitigation of the sediment that you're going to get from um, both the in-unit um, um, overland sediment, which is some, some places it is a problem, and, and landslides um, uh, from having the bigger riparian areas. You, you need those to, to hang onto the dirt. The roads, which is another uh, conduit basically for dirt and hydrologic change, and unstable slopes, which is um, the problem is that you'll increase uh, your, um, your rate uh, of landslides. Your, uh, beyond what would be natural in, in an already um, sort of landslide-driven system. That's not good for native species. Um, these guys and others that are the non-charismatic species often get forgotten, but they are the ones that rely very heavily on the smallest streams and the headwaters um, that get almost no protection. I would say virtually no protection under the current Oregon Forest Practices rules, including on state lands. Um, so you've got your um, Rye Contriton Cascadia, which is the Cascade Port Salamander, and your um, tail frog, the uh, Ascapus true eye, which are two of my favorites. Um, so as Nita mentioned, uh, recently um, uh, the feds have, have uh, had the opportunity to uh, uh, wield their authority under uh, Cesara in the way that they were actually supposed to have been wielding it all this time and be quite clear that 
um, if they don't have adequate management measures to control non-point sources, that they don't get their money. And so this was the most recent, one of the most recent letters that I was looking at. I just threw it in here to, to, to show you how they've been talking about what the problems are. Again, protect medium, small, and non-fish bearing streams, high-risk landslide areas, address impacts from roads, uh, especially older roads, and um, to ensure the adequacy of the stream buffers um, for the application of certain chemicals, which has a little bit been raised up more recently as an issue. I'm not going to uh, address that as much because I don't work on that. Um, just to re-emphasize, this issue has been in play for a really, really long time. We even had or an Oregon uh, Science Committee say that the rules were not adequate um, and that we needed to retain more trees in the right pairing areas. Um, it's taken until uh, the end of 2011 for us to actually get to the point where the board is considering a rule proposal to do this. Um, it, notwithstanding the fact that we had extensive um, input <coughs> from NIMS Fish and Wildlife and EPA, um, uh, and this is just one example um, from 2001, that the evidence is overwhelming that we have stream temperature problems and, degrade and are degrading salmon habitat for the exact same reasons that they're um, disapproving the coastal zone plan now. So just real quickly, I'm going to flip through these pretty quickly. The problem practices look like this. Um, uh, this is a small fish bearing stream. Um, that buffer is not going to cut it for provision of large wood for protection um, from solar radiation to increase um, the temperatures of those streams. Um, there's the stream. <laughs> See it? Um, this is a, a small stream that doesn't bear fish. That's a typical um, post harvest um, situation. Uh, retention is not required. This is a picture I took, which is in the West Fork Cow Creek in the Uncle Basin. Uh, same thing. Um, basically, you need the large wood uh, to create the habitat um, that salmon are used to living in and uh, the others. The problem does extend also to state lands. This picture is of a fairly, um, uh, I would say, uh, wimpy buffer on state lands that we often hear how robust they are, um, which I think it, it basically um, exemplifies exactly the problems that you find when you're looking in the uh, in all the watershed analyses. We have a lot of, of um, good stuff coming out of ODFW where the fish biologists basically lay it out. What are, what are the problems in terms of habitat and, and what do we need to do? But you look on the other side, what we actually do, and they just they just don't go together. So, um, problem. I know you said um, roads are a big problem. One way to think about it is high road density. I pulled out some of the road densities from the um, uh, mid, some of the mid-coast basins, the Kilchis, the Middle North Fort Trask, the Upper North Fort Sayusla, you're from three to over six and a half uh, miles per square mile. Um, you want to be kind of down in here uh, if you want to talk about um, ecological integrity of these watersheds. Um, it's very hard, even if you fix your roads, to um, control uh, all of the, the impacts from roads, the sedimentation and the hydro, basically there's a hydrologic connection to roads. It rains a lot in Western Oregon. Even if you really did everything right, you're still gonna have an impact on streams. So you really do wanna minimize these roads. It reduces costs um, for landowners. Um, this is probably the thing that we're the, uh, the number of the things I'm talking about here, we are not addressing in, in rules, but I'm bringing them up because um, we're addressing one small part of the bigger problem. So we've talked about the riparian. We're going to address that a little bit. We're not addressing the roads right now. Again, there's a real um, clear uh, illustration of what you don't want to happen on a forest road, but what often happens. Um, this is um, another more uh, graphic illustration of um, that I pulled out. It's probably one of the only photographs that I've seen that actually shows like a picture of a dead fish. And everybody always says, well, you can't use the Endangered Species Act for anything, or you can't, you know, really prove um, that we're harming fish um, from our practices if you don't show me a dead fish. So I pulled that out. It's not very good resolution, but it was in a, actually a Forest Service um, aquatic restoration plan that was sort of the road trigger landslide, basically just buried actually could find dead fish, so it was kind of beautiful. And um, yeah, I wish that were better resolution. So there's another example of a road-related landslide. They basically destabilize the slopes. The drainage is all messed up. Um, you saturate soils in ways that they wouldn't, wouldn't happen naturally if we had trees on there and if we didn't have the road and 
it usually delivers a lot of sediment to streams. Really, really bad things can happen in certain geologies. This is on a Forest Service road, but we're in a basin where there were a lot of um, private lands roads as well uh, draining into that, and you have a situation where you basically have redirected many, many, many small streams onto a roadbed, and it just cuts down because of the kind of soils that they have. So th this doesn't happen a lot, but it, it's, it's so dramatic, I just, it's one of my favorites. So what you want to do, obviously, is avoid this. The water is extremely powerful. It's not like, well, I guess you can see from something like this, if this happened in one storm, you know, how the Grand Canyon got created. It's, it's that kind of thing. Um, it's pretty powerful. Um, so what we want is for people to uh, basically um, create uh, things like this. This map is a... Uh, uh, from a plan that we help do for Forest Service lands that inventories um, what the problem sites are on a road system and um, basically prioritizes it for their risk of streams and does a cost analysis. And then, then we can use that to go out, and in this case on the Forest Service, you can go out and look for, um, for federal appropriations to cover it. It's an excellent tool. Um, a lot of landowners have things like this, but they do not have... Um, uh, a clear bar to meet in terms of what their road systems really need to look like uh, to minimize impacts in Oregon. They have their own uh, bar to meet, which is I need to have roads that I can haul on that are not going to be washing out. So they, they do need to have certain standards that they need to meet. Um, the Oregon Forest Practices rules do state certain standards, but what they don't give us is sort of an overall um, limit on, on uh, what your you know, road system um, uh, needs to look like in a way that's going to really effectively get at the at the overall impacts of, of logging routes. And, and they are um, extremely um, prevalent on private lands, even more so than this picture of federal lands. Um, we know that, that treating these roads works, so I'm always wondering why we aren't doing more to, um, to, to address them. There's, it's very rare, it's been very rare up until recently to even find folks addressing roads on private lands with public money. I know that Catherine's in the room was talking to me the other day about, um, about uh, working on, on road remediation um, at, uh, for non-federal lands at a watershed council level in the, um, in the roads that I worked on with the Forest Service roads, we couldn't get the private landowners to play. So we were basically dumping a lot of federal money into fixing roads in the same watershed that we were having private landowners just let their roads bleed into the into the, into the streams, and so it, it felt a lot like we were just throwing good money after bad because folks were not on the same page. So that's a real, a real issue that I have because we have federal lands and private lands intermixed um, in a lot of basins, and the feds are starting to spend a lot of money on the Forest Service and BLM lands to fix their roads, and um, we know it works. We have monitoring that shows it, um, but we're not, uh, we're not following along with finding ways to help private landowners get that done. So, the last one, I'm going to flip through these. A lot of these are the same, but there's a lot of them out there. Another area where we are not moving uh, uh, very fast is addressing unstable slopes. I'm not seeing a clear plan develop um, right now on, on, um, on addressing logging on unstable slopes through new rules. And they deal with just very steep slopes, um, like those la these last two that are right adjacent to very small buffers. You, where you're going to be increasing the risk of sliding by logging on these um, areas. Headwalls are a very frequent um, type of feature um, at the head of streams, and, and you just get, you're basically, all of these lands are, because they're already high risk, are, um, their elevation of their risk of sliding is greatly increased by clear cutting. And just, you know, these are all in the coast, all in the coast range, and all of these, um, uh, steep slope loggings. We, we actually took a lot of these pictures because we were bringing a um, Endangered Species Act lawsuit uh, to try to stop this from happening. We were not successful. <laughs> extreme adjacent land side. Again, all on the coast. So we'll look over there. This was a, a big one. That, this was the one that went into the Beaver Complex, um, which was pretty graphic. Uh, 
Mountains. And this is actually not in Oregon. This is the famous, uh, this is Stony Creek in Washington State. And the reason that I'm showing this is because it's a great picture. Um, and then also, sure that was an act of God. Man. Yeah, it was an act of God. <laughs> to also, sh to lead into the idea that, well, what do we do about the steep slope logging and the problems created by that? This is what we do, something like this. These are, uh, I have two pictures of what we do in Washington State in terms of leave areas. These are um, buffered hollows and inner gorges. In other words, we do not log it. Um, we still don't know if this is gonna actually do it in terms of reducing landslide risk uh, to, the, to the point that we might like, but it sure looks a lot better than those photos I just showed before. Um, and this is another on bedrock, bedrock hollow. They're leaving something. So um, again, it's still being, still being tested to determine whether this is a, a actually enough, but uh, I think it's pretty clearly a, a more uh, honest effort to try to keep landslide rates down. So what we're doing right now is something that I'm called for short, the ripstream rulemaking, or sometimes the PCW rulemaking at the Oregon Department of Forestry. The end of 2011, um, we got, uh, finally got movement on a study that the board had been, um, actually seen for several years before they did anything about it. They'd already received the results at least two years prior um, to show that they had data from a study from a guy that worked for them, that they couldn't dismiss as some crazy wacko environmentalist or somebody who was from another state. Um, they never liked to listen to data from another state that showed that we are warming streams, small and medium fish bearing streams beyond the protected cold water criterion of 0.3 degrees centigrade, which Celsius which is um, basically the manifestation of the anti-degradation case of the Clean Water Act for our temperature standard in Oregon. So the Green Metal article came out, it was peer reviewed, nine ways to Sunday, you really couldn't argue with it. What date was that? Uh, 2011, is the publication mm -hmm. date, is it? Yes. Yeah. Next, that's published both in Forest Ecology and Management and another journal. Um, this is directly from Oregon Department of Forestry's presentation to the board. Um, they showed the board that we have uh, private sites that post harvest are going up uh, uh, as much as 0.7 degrees C. On state forests, the results showed that their practices are not actually warming streams, according to this study. Um, so they're uh, basically <laughs> using this study to validate for this particular standard, um, the state forest management. Um, there was no way around the fact that the Forest Practices Act actually requires the board to have management practices that are adequate to meet the protecting cold water criterion of the stream temperature standard. It's right here in ORS 527-765 um, that they need to establish BMPs uh, that ensure to the maximum extent practicable uh, that we don't impair achievement and maintenance of water quality standards from forest practices. Um, it's very clear that the standards are established by the EQC, not the Department of Forestry. The Department of Forestry simply has to figure out what to do to meet the standards. This makes them very angry. <laughs> they don't, because they do not like this standard. They hate this standard. The industry thinks this standard is the most ridiculous thing they've ever seen. But guess what? It doesn't matter because they don't get to make the standard. Um, the reason it's very important that the rules be adequate is that the law shields everybody from from any violation of the Clean Water Act, forest practices rules are the compliance mechanism for water quality. So if they just pretend they're adequate and they aren't really adequate, then um, presumably we're not actually fully protecting the uses that the water quality standards were designed to protect. So that's bad. Um, and uh, they've actually agreed that to take this seriously. So this is again another thing from the presentation. They are still moving forward with this rulemaking. Okay, next. So, um, January 2012, they started doing this. They said they were gonna do the um, new rule in a year, but that did not happen. Um, it is now almost two years later, and we still have not seen a rule proposal put out. However, um, well, so let's talk a little bit about um, what the rule is gonna cover. The rule is going to cover the scope of the protecting cold water criterion standard, you would think, uh, which would be this standard actually only applies to um, streams that have uh, salmon in them, um, threatened and endangered uh, salmon. And pretty much all the salmon are, are listed. So, so not the cutthroat, but the, the salmon. Um, this is the distribution of the t and &E salmon. You would think that the rule would be fairly broadly applied. But the fact is that the rule right now is only going to apply 
The change in rule to meet the standard is only going to apply to some portion of Western Oregon, not to Eastern Oregon, because the um, board has somehow convinced itself that things work differently in, or in Eastern Oregon, and we don't have enough evidence that we're not meeting the standard in Oregon, even though we leave even less trees in Eastern Oregon. And members of the board have even said, um, from the industry side, have even said that the scientific basis for the standards in Eastern Oregon were far weaker than the ones in Western Oregon, which would lead me to believe that the problem might be even worse over there, but nonetheless, they're not going to do anything about it. Um, so right now, it's going to apply to small and medium fish streams to which the protecting cold water criterion applies. And I think that people are going to argue very vociferously um, to narrow the footprint of the streams to which the rule applies. So they're going to they're going to rake news <coughs> over the coals about where the salmon actually are, um, and try to, to argue about that map that I just showed you before. So that's that's what I'm seeing come out. Some portion of Western Oregon right now it seems that they may leave out the the Siskiyou region. So the next um, shows you what the Oregon Department of Forestry's uh, regions are. They've already decided to leave out the Blue Mountains and the Eastern Cascades. They have a very vague commitment to somehow address the riparian problems over there at some point in the future in their work plan, um, but it's, it doesn't sound very promising. But they are still moving uh, this year to put a rule in place um, that would cover um, most of Western Oregon. Still the question mark is, is whether or not they'll leave in the Siskiyou. And then um, the reasoning is that, that the even though the, the basal area, the current rules uh, have the same requirement for small and medium fish bearing streams in the Siskiyou as the rest of Western Oregon. Um, next one. It's slightly different in the Siskiyou for uh, medium streams, and it's like 20, you know, 30 square feet per thousand feet different. In other words, you have to leave somewhat fewer trees in your riparian area in the Siskiyou for reasons that are not really very clear if you go back and look at the rationale of the rule, but in any case don't have anything to do with how the, the mechanics of stream shading um, versus basal layer really work, because what we're talking about is, is establishing a standard that prevents uh, removal of existing trees, regardless of how many trees are there. You can't, you can't bring the shade down beyond a certain point that you would violate the standard. So it's unclear why this why this supports leaving out the Siskiyou. So we're going to put up a fight on this one, because I don't, I don't think they have a reason. Um, even though you know, they, they're trying to trump some up. But because the industry is going pretty ape about the fact that we might get some significant rule changes to meet this standard, that may happen. So all we have now to go on is some preliminary analysis from ODF that was really just released about a week ago, or a week and a half ago, at least to me. Um, that shows that um, if you remove more than about 15% of the existing um, trees measured in basal area, um, which is the metric that we use for sort of measuring uh, biomass of trees within the riparian zone, if you remove more than about 15%, um, you're going to violate the 0.3 degree protecting cold water standard, which is this dotted line. Um, and uh, that is a lot more, uh, that's a much greater limitation than I think um, industry expected to see from the results, even though it's highly consistent with what uh, other states have found. Um, you could look at this a different way in terms of a no cut area, and it's coming out around 85 feet no cut, um, is about what you would need to be assured of pre 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 preventing a point three degrees. And this is for small and medium um, streams, as they're finding consistently. And again, this is very consistent with what they're finding in Washington State, the implementation of their rules. About a 75 to 80 foot no cut is what you need. Um, you stay, stay out in order to avoid warming streams. And I think we all realize that we're warming streams anyway. Um, we've got warming going on. We don't need to help climate change along by, uh, by warming it from stream adjacent timber harvest. So um, again, this shouldn't be such a heavy lift. Oregon's rules for small non fish bearing streams are way below Washington, California, uh, and what NIMS at one point actually recommended, but they've never recommended this again because it was so unpopular. Um, this is the no cut and partial cut um, uh, small fish bearing streams. This is what we have now, about a 20 foot no cut retention within 50, but the fact is, like the buffer I showed you before, you can pretty much meet your retention requirements within 20 feet. So in most of Western Oregon, you're looking at a 20 
20 foot retention and, and not much outside of that. Same goes for, um, what was that last one? That was fish bearing. This is small non fish bearing. These are the two most sort of stark examples. This one we're not addressing right now. The protecting cold water criterion doesn't apply to the non fish bearing streams unless you can show that the cold water is necessary to protect downstream reaches. Um, neither DEQ nor, nobody seems to be very clear about what that means, so they're just kind of leaving that out of the rulemaking. And we're not going to address small non fish bearing streams to which we apply zero riparian protection right now. But all the streams need cold water. How can they say those don't apply? Well, it doesn't flow downstream. <laughs> yeah. The excellent question. And not only do they downstream need cold water, but you, the streams themselves, um, if they're perennial streams, certainly the cold, Clean Water Act applies to them. Yeah, and this is it. I mean, I'm done. So, um, as Lisa mentioned, the argument against raising the regulatory bar are their legion, but one of them is that we have really great land use laws and we've been really successful at preventing conversion of forest land to, uh, to non-forest uses. Look how bad things are in Washington. You think their rules are so great, they keep converting stuff to residential and suburban uses and we don't. So let us off uh, the hook for meeting uh, water quality standards. It's not, it's, it's, you know, it's good, I'm glad, you're, I'm glad you're succeeding in this, but it's, it's not related to whether or not we're meeting water quality standards. So there's the coast, there's the sunset, there's the salmon jumping rainy falls, and there's my cute dog. <laughs> So uh, my name is Jordan Wolbuster. I'm an assistant professor at Oregon State University in the College of Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric Sciences. And um, to be honest, I hadn't thought much about logging effects on ocean acidification until Paul contacted me to participate in this panel uh, about a month or so, two months ago. So um, what I want to do is, is first maybe back up to the ocean and then move inland. And so just to be sure to <coughs> think about this clearly and, and, and uh, effectively, so ocean acidification, as it's been defined most frequently, is the increase in carbon dioxide, dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean due to the burning of fossil fuels that changes the pH of the ocean and changes fundamentally the carbon chemistry in ways that ultimately can make uh, that water more corrosive than fossil fuels. So, so that has been sort of the, the primary definition of ocean acidification for probably about 15 years or so now. In the last five to 10 years, there's been a real increase in trying to understand what effect that increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will have in the coastal zone. And I've been arguing for quite a while now that it's not just the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere we need to be thinking about in the coastal zone, but it's all the other biogeochemical processes and other things that lead to changes in pH and saturation state, this measure of corrosiveness for the minerals in these coastal environments, uh, in large part because we can see this, we can see this very clearly in the open ocean places where there's very little human activity far away from land. There's a very clear lockstep change in the, in the pH of the ocean and how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. And as you move in closer to land, there are many other processes that change that pH and make it much harder to discern that signal. But we're affecting the carbon chemistry in the coastal zone. And in fact, that's really where many of the resources that we're interested in, salmon or shellfish, live. And so to me, the um, Ocean acidification doesn't just encompass this change in atmospheric CO2, but it's all these other processes that also affect that. So I think the thing that probably is most relevant to this story is probably uh, nutrient release. And so the reason we have this increase in CO2 is we're taking this, this rich, uh, energy rich organic carbon out of the middle of the interior of the earth and we're oxidizing that. And so uh, in many places where we have coastal development, this is where I thought about this more frequently. You have nutrient runoff, fertilizer, agricultural uses, and that fertilizer stimulates production. And that production of organic matter is essentially burned in the same way by organisms. It's just done more slowly, but that respiration of that organic matter releases that CO2, lowers the pH, lowers the saturation state in those waters. So um, in many of these coastal environments, those changes are quite a bit larger than what we can attribute to just the change in the atmospheric CO2 levels alone. The, the upside of this is that that gives us an opportunity to address some of these local drivers and do something that by time at least, on the short term, to help improve the water quality for coastal resources that we're interested in. So uh, most of the work that I've done on this is really thinking about 
septic system, sewage treatment, these sort of really um, well-known and, and, and agricultural use as well, well-known and well-documented sources of nitrogen, <coughs> the fertilizer to the coastal zone. So um, looking at pictures of, of clear cuts, there's certainly a possibility, I don't know what the answer is at this moment, how much nutrients, and maybe other people in the room here might know this better, but, but that changing that land use, changing the trees that are pulling those nutrients out of the ground, is, will help mobilize those nutrients into those coastal waterways and deliver those down into our estuaries. And so that is a potential uh, impact of this on terms of the coastal zone chemistry. And then the question becomes, is that do those nutrients stick around long enough in these estuaries and these coastal zones to fuel this production? And so there's another important component of this is the timing of year that this happens and when the lights are on. And so when there's really the production is there, the nutrients are there, and the water's sticking around long enough in these estuaries, then there's a very real possibility in my mind that, that this could contribute to these uh, sorts of effects. And so to take that back around then, to make a connection to uh, the shellfish industry, we've been working with the shellfish industry out here since about 2009 when I came out here. Um, and uh, some of you are probably aware that they've had a real problem with producing oyster seed for the shellfish growers. And by 2010, we had linked that specifically to carbon dioxide, excess carbon dioxide <coughs> in the water that was coming into their hatcheries. And so since that time now, we've been able to help the shellfish industry address this problem by simply uh, helping them by monitoring what's happening in these shellfish hatcheries, as well as they're actually buffering the water in their hatcheries. And so we call that the Tums approach. And so they're actually putting an antacid into their seawater coming into the plant to help these oyster seeds survive. Um, and in this time, in this, in this window of time, since about 2007 or so, the natural spawns of Pacific oysters in Wolfa Bay have also have been well below commercially viable levels. And so they're around, there's a few of them around, but they haven't had a good, solid recruitment of, of oysters in the natural environment in Wolfa Bay, which is one of the few places where they actually reside. So, put a ton of money into one What's that? They put a ton of money into trying to save the local bay. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so this is a commercial species that's starting a hatchery, and we don't really know what the answer is for a lot of the native species that are around. Um, we know from laboratory experiments that many of those organisms are sensitive; they will be impacted. Um, and the problem is really for a lot of these things is timing, and so we know that big grown-up adult oysters are much more robust, they're more resilient. The changes in chemistry, they, they have sort of the ability to compensate for, for change. Things can clam up, right, so they close up their shells, and that's actually one of the, one of the neat sort of um, adaptive uh, capacities of bivalves is that they can actually then redissolve the interior of their shell to buffer their own metabolic acids and water quality is bad for periods of time. That's why you can take oysters out of the water, get them to market alive several days later still, they're still breathing very slowly, but they're buffering their own acids from their shell. So it's these oyster larvae that are in the water for very short periods of time, and so you don't need conditions to be bad for very long to have very major impacts that trickle into the production of either commercial or native shellfish. Um, so I, I wasn't going to talk too long, so I just wanted to give a real brief background and then maybe just open it up for more discussion. Then. A couple things. Um, the Oregon Department of Forestry has, has talked about the fact that 70% of the streams in the state are threatened or indeed endangered because of temperature sediment and chemicals. And yet the Forest Practices Act, as you clearly said, is fully incapable of addressing that. One specific case in point is Quartz Creek off of the main stem of the McKinsey, where there were between four and 500 designations of high-risk areas, high-risk sites, and northern spotted owl sites that meant nothing to the operator. How can they identify in their facts program potential threats and yet do nothing? And then the second question is how can the Institute for Natural Resources basically do a study on the science that the Oregon Board of Forestry is using and say it's completely incomplete and, and that there's much better science 
and yet the Oregon Board of Forestry continually skates. How come? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, give a generic, I'll give a generic answer and deal with the follow-up. Um, the, 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 I guess my worldview is that if there's something that you want to be able to achieve, there has to be a federal law to be able to make it happen, and there has to be an opportunity for citizen suits in that federal law. And that's just my worldview about, um, or, or some other way of getting to the court, I should put it that way, because there, there are other ways of getting to court besides citizen suits. But, um, but without federal laws, um, that come to bear on very, you know, very specifically on pollution sources or, or habitat degradation sources, um, it's, it's very difficult, and generally speaking, it's impossible to sort of make change in any time, any reasonable time frame, if at all. Um, so, you know, again, the Clean Water Act doesn't give, you know, doesn't give you any handles, um, and the, the sheer paucity of handles, uh, federal handles, is really why we got this Cesar lawsuit. Um, it was because there were, there were no other options, and, um, and it may prove not to have worked when it's all over. You know, so, um, so, so that's that. Um, as to why the Department of Forestry and the Board of Forestry feel free to ignore the law and the facts, I'll let Mary address that. <laughs> uh, okay, well, there's the, the first reason that, that, that folks can log high-risk sites <coughs> in a tributary to the Mackenzie, which is like crown jewel of Oregon, um, is that the rules allow it. You do have to identify steep and unstable slopes, but unless they would deliver to um, a building or a house, uh, if it's public, if it's a risk to public safety, they don't have to, um, they don't have to leave anything. We don't have any requirement that that happen. We don't have a state environmental policy act that we even run it through or something like that. So, so that's really what it, what it is. I mean, and that's the rule that we're looking for, is, is if there be required retention. Okay, so why don't we have retention, uh, even though we know that we need it for fish and that other states do it, it's because the board is industry dominated, and that's by law. So we need, um, I think that even though we are moving towards a better uh, board, and we do have some, some movement there, we, we simply have the, the timber industry is far, its political power is far outsized compared to its economic um, place in, in our economy, but it's, 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 it's very favored, you know. I mean, it's got a historical significance. I think we all, you know, we all romanticize historical things, but um, yeah, it's it's a real problem. So I really think we need. Um, we've had we've had a really hard time getting public. There's been no well-funded, coordinated public <coughs> campaign, um, you know, to to really get this the, the reform going. And in, even when we had a significant momentum at the in the early 2000s, we thought in his office first administration, he talked very big about salmon, um, really he was not willing to go beyond what they, what kind, what the collaborative solution um, would would be. And so uh, we had to turn to citizen suits, and a lot of those photographs were, were basically taken in support of the Citizen Suit under the Endangered Species Act to try to argue that that increasing the risk of landslides on salmon bearing streams, as we're doing, is, is a take under the ESA. But um, due to uh, another industry lawsuit you know, on the other side, we lost the listing in the middle of that, and then we just lost our mojo and, and uh, never finished prosecuting. But what did Oregon do in response to that lawsuit? They actually weakened the Oregon Forest Practices Act so that they no longer approve written plans. They just do notice and comment because they didn't want to have blood on their hands. They were like, well, it might be that we're approving things that violate the ESA, and so we want to pull back a little bit and make it seem like we're just hanging our landowners out to dry. So I would say if I had to if I had to, to do one thing to change that, I would have a legislative initiative that requires the state to shoot for Endangered Species Act sufficiency of its rules on state and private lands like Washington did. So that we basically have an HCP or something like a habitat conservation plan that, that raises the bar. As it is now, they just sort of are picking off at their leisure pieces of the rules to try to fix and then sort of see if they can if they can get by for another few years. So they've, they've done a bunch of little things. Now they're having to do some big things. And frankly, I, I don't know. I mean, something bad could happen still to this rulemaking. Um, although I think they, they, they're going to have a hard time getting out of it this time. They're going to have to do something. But, but one thing I want to emphasize that Mary touched on earlier was she made a reference to the Ripstream study was um, 
was done by by uh, staff for the Department of Forestry you're associated with them. And and that's a kind of a key thing because the Department of Forestry has a way of writing off the work that anybody else does, especially a sister agency like the Oregon DQ. Um, but really anybody else's work isn't adequate, um, both in state and out of state. And so um, so and then one of the things you compare is, well, how much how much are they studying um, in this state? And you compare it to what they're doing in Washington without saying Washington's on target or you know getting all their studies done on time right. or anything like that. They have a whole lot more in the hopper than what Oregon does. Yeah, and so, money in so it's just this thing about drivers um, that even if the whole system is broken and it's slow and it's ponderous and it does little chunks at a time, is that if there are no drivers for anything to happen, then you can count on nothing happen, happening. And so the, the Ripstream study was a driver. The Cesara thing is a different kind of driver. It's not you know, it's a more political funding driver. But we need more of those as well as reform at the state Where can level. we access this Ripstream, Ripstream study? Um, or the Department of Forestry's website. Yeah. <coughs> you can I can send it to you, too. I mean, I have both the published studies. Really quick, um, one of the pieces I noted in your in your slideshow was that uh, uh, that the state EPA retained jurisdiction or retained the enforcement capacity uh, outside of this very specific limited uh, you know part that was delegated to forestry for its rules. And I'm curious if that's a potential lever, you know, within the state bureaucracy. I mean, is there? That's an excellent question that I kind of want to ask Nina because ODF can enforce its own rules, but yeah. if e what what is the next thing like? What would happen right now if if they said, you know what, we're not going we're not going to do this rule for whatever reason, we're going to stall it out? Is there something EQC can do? Oh, the yeah, the Environmental Quality Commission, which is like it's a citizens board that right. oversees the work of EQ, um, they they can um, they can basically petition the board of forestry for changes, um, and there are a lot of things they can do, and 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 then if the time a certain amount of time elapses, a couple of years. They can basically um, have the permit, the, excuse me, the permit, but the BMP shield mm -hmm. removed um, <clears throat> from those people who are continuing to use the same practices. But the fact is, is that the commission has never been willing to do that, mm -hmm. and the Department of Environmental Quality's um, directors have never been willing to do that. And we are at an, I would say, I don't know if it's possible, but an all time. <laughs> Maybe it's just always low, but an all-time low <laughs> in terms of of DEQ management's willingness to put themselves out there. So we put them in the spotlight in, in our settlement, and 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 they, you know, begrudgingly I guess accepted it for a short period of time until they walked away from it. And now, now there is a lot more clear is that DEQ is simply not going to do anything about non-point sources. And it's it's part of it is well they're just afraid and and the, the fear <coughs> is somewhat legitimate. Um, they DEQ was doing some uh, some rulemaking on toxic criteria and tinkered with in a, a meaningless way tinkered with some stuff that that supposedly might affect agriculture, which it didn't. None of this affected agriculture, and and even so, the ag lobby went after DEQ's funding successfully mm -hmm. in the next legislative. Essentially, so, so, so that's you know, DEQ is just very, very politically skittish, mm -hmm. and so then you get to the question of, you know, ultimately it just keeps coming back to the governor. Is the governor does the governor want to do something different, and is he prepared to you know, tell the agencies to work together to shoulder the burden, to you know, deflect some of the politics or what have you? And you know, as Mary mentioned in his first couple of terms. He was supposedly saving salmon. I was told that by his people um, repeatedly. That was the legacy he was going to leave. Oregon was to save salmon, and that's not part of his. That's not part of his thing now, right? Now, now he's on to other stuff because he saved the salmon. I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> maybe they're not worth saving. So, um, so it really, it just really keeps boiling down to politics. And when I think about, you know, there are not enough. There are a lot of organizations concerned about trees and a lot concerned yeah. about fish, but there is a paucity of organizations that are really working on these private lands yeah. practices and 
you know, what you see is when you see Mary um, up here sort of being the main representative, that tells you something. I'm tired. And it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. Um, but, but, on the, but by the same token, as you know, live, you know, those of you who live in Eugene, there is a lot of attention to the pesticide yeah. issue. And, and, you know, my view is that people ought, to the extent that they're successful, which they may or may not be, this pesticide issue has been going on since at least the 70s, but, um, but people ought to be thinking much more broadly when they go and demand reforms on logging pesticides, they ought to be demanding reforms on logging issues across the board. And to be too narrow is really to cut our own throats. Uh, I'd just like to make the comment, uh, I live in the real world where some of these issues come up and I'm a gatekeeper for some uh, holdings behind me, this, uh, mainly private and some BLM further up. And I had the experience on the, uh, when I, I, I'm a subscriber for when they do some things, you know. Mm -hmm. And I noticed uh, on the, uh, there's been two clear cuts, one just recently, and one was in, uh, the thing, thing what, what happened is, Brother, after, could, you, could you ask a question and if we want to, just we could discuss. Yeah, I, wanna, I know one of the question is, the, uh, about the, the, the non-bearing strings, the, the, or their draws, and they affect me lower down and, and for my water supply. And they break all the strategies down, and, and the soil goes down, and I see it on both sides of the road, and from the creek and all the soil that comes down. And I don't think the buffers are adequate. And I'm in the spray, I have some issues with the spraying stuff too. Well, the non-fish bearing streams, and I, I know Mary said this repeatedly, but because the phrases go by quickly, the non-fish bearing streams, are not getting, are not part of the rulemaking that the Department of Forestry and the Board of Forestry are looking at right now. They are called out by the federal agencies as an issue that, needs, that the state needs to address, and we have zero indication of whether the state will be addressing the non-fish bearing streams, which are, you know, not having to put any buffers around them is part of the reason why you can see those enormous clear cuts where there literally is nothing left. I think what they've been doing for the most part with this with this inadequate buffer where they have a drinking water source below is if you were to come up and talk to them, if you were to get the notice ahead of time and you were to come up and make raise a stink, they would they would negotiate with you. I Maybe, but with they wouldn't change the rule for everybody. I negotiated over the to remove the address in a two foot deep. I did that, and I had two state foresters up there on my property line, and where my well was. And the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, and I also, when they, another one come in here to go up and road building there, I'm a subscriber, and I could have held them up for three or four days. So that I don't know why the state forestry in Coos Bay did that, but I had the right to refuse the, the contractor to go in. I don't know. Yeah. See, I think they placate people, though, on a one-by-one -one basis. They placate individual landowners, and then that way they kind of... I had comment to give on it. Yeah, but not everybody's like you going to see something. Um, <coughs> I wonder if uh, about Ms. Sorlop and Ms. Walpus would you comment on the following. I'm very much interested in climate change, and um, uh, certainly uh, <coughs> climate's going to increase more than 0 0.3 degrees Celsius over the next 50 to 100 years. And the pH will be significantly worse in the next 50 or years. Could you each comment on on how you think this will impact strategies to address both the, the, the interior of the streams and the interior of the uh, of the oceans, uh, aside from the nutrient uh, element? So, I'll throw that to both of you. Well, if, if, actually, if I could address the temperature thing for a second, um, I, <laughs> which is which is uh, that the. the and again, Mary touched on this earlier, but talking about how the, the standard that is driving this particular rulemaking at the Board of Forestry right now is focused on um, fish bearing streams. But it's also that this part of the standard really only applies to waters that are already colder than the numeric criteria. So all the waters that Mary talked about that are impaired, that is to say, they are higher than 16 or 18 degrees or the spawning temperatures that apply at different times and places. But the ones that are impaired, of which we have a lot in Oregon, yeah. that's our biggest pollution problem is temperature. This rule may not end up applying to them because, we don't know yet, but because they could make an argument that their study only looked at mm -hmm. what 
the impact of logging was on cold streams, not on already hot streams. Aww. So, <laughs> so there's a the, you know the parsing of everything and the cutting up of little into little pieces is part of the problem. But in terms of the temperature standards, um, the, their e EPA is struggling in various situations to try and figure out how to climate change with regard to the standards and the way the standards are implemented in these total maximum daily loads. And so it's very much pilot project-y sort of stuff right now, um, but I will give EPA some credit for, for being out front on that. Now, as far as ocean acidification, which yeah, is bad that, without climate change, I don't know. Yeah, so the, so the water quality criteria for pH is, I think, uh, 0.2 units above baseline is, is what an impaired water body would be with uh, a lower pH. And, and I think the issue is that um, the way that we tend to think about these global changes is sort of really minor shifts in things. And what we understand now from, from the shellfish biology side and their response and shellfish larval response to social certification is that they have thresholds that, mm -hmm. they, that when you cross a threshold and it's, it's not necessarily that it's just from the baseline, it's that much on top of an extreme event. And so for oyster production, in the Northwest, one of the big issues is we have, what actually supports a lot of the seafood industry is the subwelling of cold, deep water from the ocean that has lots of nutrients and lots of CO2. And we've been ratcheting the baseline on that for since the Industrial Revolution. And that has shifted the distribution of the chemistry in the California current in a way that's actually moved the saturation state by about 0.5 units, which is a very significant change in the overall Harmony chemistry, and what that's done is it creates more instances when you get measurements that we know are for are uh, poor for shellfish for growing shellfish larvae, and we get conditions now that are actually corrosive in the California current where those did not occur previously. The best we can do with models in subtracting out the the additional amount of carbon that's been put into the system. And so I I've tried to reframe some of the discussion on this and thinking about carbonate weather. Right, we think about climate and weather, and it's the extreme events and weather that drive a lot of the, the hardships that we face and sort of the, the climate change impacts. And I, I believe in the coastal zone, it's exactly the same thing. And so there's a, there's a weather, there's a climatology in the coastal mm -hmm. zone. And by adding that little CO2, whenever you have those extreme events, those extreme events become a bit more extreme. And if the timing of those um, change, or, or adding that little bit of carbon in, what it ultimately does, it changes the frequency and the duration of times that are good that will support um, shellfish production. And so the EPA recognizes this, and they're struggling with, with trying to determine those pH standards. And they recognize that pH isn't what really what we need to be looking at either. And so they're trying to, and working with NOAA, to try to understand how do we come up with a metric that we can use to describe a fundamental shift in the, in the chemistry of the system that is beyond pH. And, um, I can talk for quite a while about why pH isn't the best thing to use, but pH will decouple from the carbonate chemistry based on the salinity. So you can change saturation state much more effectively if you have lower salinity water, which more buffering in the ocean than in the estuary. So the same amount of CO2 in the estuary changes the pH a lot more than it does in the ocean. And so the recognition that the pH isn't going to be the thing that we have to look at is there, but I don't think anyone knows how to do that quite yet. So. I, I just want to follow on with the idea that the standard, you know, looking at one of these sort of substandards of 0.3 degrees C, what we're really saying there is we shouldn't have any management related impact on stream temperature. And I think the need to minimize our impact, I, I do think we're going to probably end up rewriting temperature standards continuously because they're not, we haven't quite exactly got them right. But the point is, to not have that impact, and we need to continue to minimize our impact because we already have these greater impacts. And it's not just about the riparian shade, obviously it's about all of the other things that we're doing that are, is going to cause us to have uh, a more, you know, sort of more extreme react response in the watershed uh, to the big storm events and other extreme weather events that we're gonna look forward to. If we don't shore up these watersheds to function as close as they can, to you know, sort of have their natural amount of resilience and function the way that they ought to, then we're going to end up holding the bag. We're going to have worse results. So it, I mean, it's the same parallel thing. But I think point focusing on the point three degrees. See, I'd rather not be there. 
I'd rather we do something a little more holistic and systemic. Paul, Paul was the idea behind this panel, so I'll let him have the last question. Well, I just want to make, first I want to say thank you, Nina, for setting the stage for all this big stressor driver discussion because we wouldn't be here forcing forestry on this. But everybody needs to know that uh, there's an opportunity for comment, so the last word should be engagement. So right, please right. do. So um, easily done. Uh, sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint or whatever, but if you go to northwestenvironmentaladvocates.org, over on the right-hand side, it says coastal something or other, it's not bad for you. Um, and you click on that, and there's a page that has has fact sheets if you like them short, it has fact sheets that are longer, it has fact sheets specifically on pesticides. Um, this weekend, by the end of this weekend, I'll, there'll be a little template letter that sort of shows you how to, what sentences to write and then plug in your concerns, because um, it's a little complicated. It's not like writing comments on anything, but the comments are due um, on March 20th, um, and the, um, all the documents that you would need and the information are on that Site. You can also type in Cesara and you will go to an EPA or NOAA website and you can, you know, sort of click on lots of buttons and you'll find Oregon and you'll eventually find the Oregon documents there. Um, but you can also get that same direction through our website. So um, I definitely urge people to write comments. We have not done any sort of postcardy, generic letters because, frankly, um, I don't think that they. They, I don't think those things count, but what really does count is if you explain to the federal agencies why you think that Oregon does not have a program in place. And, and the distinction here is it's not a plan, it has to be more than a plan, it has to be a program, but having a program doesn't mean that they've solved all the problems, because obviously, you know, nobody has solved the problems. What is that website? It's northwestenvironmentaladvocates.org. So who do the comments go? It's not the state board. Uh, they have, no, no, they go, they go to um, a very specific person that NOAA um, who's taking the comments on behalf of both the federal agencies. Can I send that second pamphlet that you have there with your name on? Uh, no, I don't. Um, we, I got a sick one that you issued that. Oh, oh, the... It says public comment in there. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. <coughs>